Today is the second installment in our behind the scenes look at the scoring of the movie Shelf Life. We're going to be looking at an action cue. Action cues are a lot of fun to score. They're vibrant. There's all sorts of energy and there's some different considerations in writing this type of music. So let's listen to this cue. It's only a couple minutes long and then we'll come back and look at the ideas that I use and things that you might use in your own compositions. Well, this certainly has that feeling of excitement, of action. Something's happening. Probably the first thing you notice is the tempo. We're at quarter note equals 172.5, a fairly quick tempo. I find that these action cues, I typically write between say 140 to 180. So that's a pretty fast tempo, which helps with the adrenaline, that feeling of action. But it also helps you in another way. By dividing the beat in that quick of a succession, you're able to hit more hit points somewhere on the beat. So say you're at this tempo. Well, your hit point is likely to fall on a quarter note, an eighth note, or some division of the beat. Let's also look at these time signatures. You can see that they're changing quite often here. And that, again, is helping me hit certain cues during this score. But also, by using time signatures like this 7-8, it's giving this sense of forward momentum. The 7-8 I've grouped into a group of four and a group of three. So it's one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. And by having that second group of three, only be three eighth notes instead of four, it gives this little forward hitch in momentum. So it's one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. And I find that those type of meters really work well in action cues. Let's look at the figure that I've used here. So here's the figure in this seven eight bar of four eighth notes and then three eighth notes. And I've also grouped it that way in notation as well as sound. It makes it easier for the musicians to feel this. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. Let's take a listen to that figure. You can hear how this meter of 7-8 is adding a lot of energy to the music. This figure comes from a previous cue, 1M1. Here it's acting in this action cue. It's got forward momentum. It's really driving the cue. 
In 1M1, it functions in an entirely different way. Let's take a look at where this comes from. In a cue that we've looked at before, 1M1, we see relatively the same figure with this added note at the end of the group of three. By having this in the time signature of 4-4, four, four, it takes out that forward momentum that we felt from the 7-8 grouping, so that, along with the orchestration and the tempo, give these notes a much different feeling, more of a dreamy or mysterious feeling. Let's listen to this. So by using these cells of notes in different ways, you get not only a lot more mileage out of your material, but there's a certain cohesion that starts to form in your score by using these cells throughout it. Let's look at another spot where I've used a melody for a main character in a very different way. Here in the French horns, we see this melody, which was originally in 4-4 four, four in the Q1M1, the same one that we just looked at. So if we play this melody now conformed into 7-8, it sounds a little bit different. You'll hear a pickup note played here. At the same time that this once 4-4 four, four melody now conformed to 7-8 is playing, I have a 7-8 rhythmic pulse playing underneath this melody to give it, again, that forward feeling, that feeling of action. Let's listen to the pulse that's playing underneath this. So once again, you can see that we have these groupings of four plus three playing in that seven, eight time underneath the melody to give us that forward momentum and that sense of excitement and action. Now let's listen to this seven, eight driving pulse along with the melody and see how they work together. thing to consider in action cues are levels of intensity. At the end of the cue, the climax typically will be the highest level of intensity. So in the beginning of your cue, you want to start somewhere that gives you room to grow. Another nice thing about this cue is that there are moments of comedy in it. So we get a little bit of a rest and we have to address that in the music. This is the type of music that just doesn't start a pulse and then wallpaper over the whole scene. We're addressing each moment. Here you can see we have a character that leaps and we address it in the music. Here we have another leap of the character, but we've left this open with absolutely no music. That's because there's an important sound effect that happens at that moment and we want to leave it clear. It adds to the comedy. Now, if we look after that leap, we return to our intense feeling and that same melody that we are just looking at, but now at a higher level of intensity. Let's listen to all of that and see, even within this moment, how these levels change. Let's look at an orchestration technique I'm using in this piece, particularly in the French horns. Here in measure 26, I have all six French horns playing a melody in unison. They rest for four beats and then they continue to play in unison. But this time there's a difference. There are these little plus signs above their notes. 
What that symbol means is for the French horn player to stop the note. It changes the sound of the note to a more brassy sound. The way they do that is they insert their fingers into the bell and then they close their palm, closing off that entire bell. And it makes for that more brassy sound. Now, when they do this, they also have to finger that note a half step lower. Let's listen to what those two different sounds sound like. We'll start with these open notes and then we'll move to these stopped notes. I love that sound of a stop French horn. It's such a unique color, especially at the level of forte and above. Now you might think that the pitch being up a half step and having to finger it a half step lower means that as you close your hand, as you close that bell, that the pitch is actually rising a half step, but that's not what's happening. As you close your hand, the pitch is actually falling. It's not until it's completely closed off in the bell that that pitch rises a half step. The reason is, is because you're accentuating a harmonic in a lower pitch to get that higher sound. So don't think that you can slowly close your hand and have the pitch rise. It works exactly the opposite way. All right, let's look at one more technique that I was really excited to be able to use in this cue. Starting in measure 54, I'm using the compositional technique known as a tone row. The tone row was developed in the early 1920s by composers like Arnold Schoenberg. And the idea behind it is they wanted to move away from tonality. The way they did this was by using all 12 notes of the chromatic scale putting them into whatever order they wanted to in a tone row, but giving no extra weight to any note. In the tonal system, of course, the one chord or the five have extra weight to them. There's a sense of home. But here, since there's no extra weight given to any note, we never really know where a resting place is. There's no sense of home, which works great for these kind of chaotic moments in an action cue. Now, you can use these tone rows in any order you'd like, but you have to abide by certain rules. So here we have the note A I begin with. I can play that A as many times as I want in any octave, but once I've moved on to the next note in my tone row, the G sharp, I can't return to that A until I've made it all the way through all of the other notes in my row. Now, this row can be transposed into any you know, starting position as long as the relationship of the intervals are the same. It can be inverted, it can be played backwards, it can be retrograde inversion. And to see all of these possibilities in one place, they came up with a very clever solution of something called a matrix. So let me show you what that looks like. I found this matrix calculator online. They're fairly easy to search for. If you do find one you like, make sure to support the people who went through the trouble to make this. All right, let's enter our notes of our tone row. So it's A, G sharp, C, B, F, F sharp, G, C sharp, A sharp, D sharp, E, and then D. Now in the old days, you would have had to go through the trouble of filling this out by hand. They came up with a very clever method of assigning number values to each of the notes from zero to 11. And then by using simple mathematical formulas, they would calculate from the original row the rest of the notes to fill in the matrix. Let's take a look at how to read this matrix. The P stands for prime. So this prime zero is our original tone row from left to right. The R stands for retrograde. So R0 is our original tone row from right to left. If we go to P1, this is our original tone row simply transposed up a half step. So the A becomes an A sharp, the G sharp becomes an A, and so on. The I stands for inversion. So if we look at the tone row going from 
top to bottom, the intervals are inverted. In our original, we went from A to G sharp, so down a half step. But here, in our inversion, we go from A to A sharp, up a half step, and so on. The RI stands for retrograde inversion. So if we were to read this from bottom to top, we have the retrograde inversion of our original tone row. So in the end, this matrix is just a very clever way of listing the 47 permutations of your original tone row that you might use in this style of composition. Let's take a listen to how I've used it here, starting in measure 54, going through to measure 62. Now I've used it in a very straight ahead manner, but I think in an effective manner. I'll start back a few measures and this, this is kind of a fun moment right here in measure 52 and 53. It's a quote from a very famous movie with a woman and a knife and a shower. I, th I think you'll know which one it is. Let's take a listen to this. Tone rows can be such a powerful technique, especially in a scene like this, which is filled with intensity and chaos, because the tone row itself is a form of controlled chaos. Yes, we have a formula for it, but to the listener, they never know what's coming next. It's a surprise from moment to moment. Composers like Jerry Goldsmith use the tone row in scores like his score for Planet of the Apes, very much in the same way. I hope you'll try some of these ideas that we talked about today in your own music. And thanks for following along as I work on this score for the movie Shelf Life. Now let's listen one more time to this cue, 1M4 Throne. And I'll see you all next time.